Hello, everyone. I'm Steve. Hello, everyone out there. I'm Steve Lochran. I work at HP Laboratories in Bristol in England. Uh, my email address is stevelochran at hp.com. I'm also stevel at apache.org. I believe I'm currently the only committer in the building for, oh, for, Hamoop, for Hadoop. For, there are other Apache people in the building, quite a few, but I'm the only one that actually can commit to Hadoop Core and HGFS and MapReduce. I will run through the slides. If we've got extra time, we will bring up this source code repository and delete random lines or something like that to keep people busy. But the point is, if anything doesn't work, it's my fault and you should come and complain to me. However, all that work on Hadoop, it's... I don't do it full time. What we're really doing is working on infrastructure on demand inside HP. And Hadoop is... One, it's one of the really big use cases, bringing up Hadoop cl the clusters on demand and working with them. But also, it's actually one of the big infrastructures to use behind the scenes. So for that reason, we are really interested in bringing Hadoop up in virtual infrastructures. All right, so here's the background. We work on data center style problems. I'm a committer on various Hadoop projects. I also think testing is very important, and I don't think we have enough of them in Hadoop or other Apache projects. Effectively, what I'm doing is one very large test case. So, hands up who's heard of cloud computing. Hands up who thinks that all the descriptions of it make any sense whatsoever. Okay, that's good. I'll ask you questions later. Um, I don't know what it means, and they're always inconsistent. They mean different things to different people. My colleagues and I, we focus on the notion on infrastructure on demand, where you can issue an API call to get virtual machines and services associated with them, with the services of storage and messaging and things like that. And it's, it doesn't have to be outsourced. It can be inside your own organization, too. The key thing is anybody should have the right to create a virtual machine from an API call. You should be one button click away from having an entire cluster of machines at your disposable. And that's really good, because it eliminates all the hassle of guessing how many machines you're going to need, buying them, installing them, and getting them working. However, it also eliminates some of the things you get from having a set of machines like that. Key one being, if it's all outsourced, there is nobody in the data center who has a pager that cares about you. Hands up who has a pager that goes off when things go wrong in their, their projects. Oh, okay. You're lucky. I was in that once. It's not a good place to be. Anyway, so it has some benefits. There are some prices too, and it's interesting how we're going to move to this world. So one of the, the things we've been looking at is how, how to make this transition to an infrastructure on demand world easier than it is today. And a key point is, is that when you're actually creating machines on demand, all the old assumptions are gone. You can't hard code host names into JSP pages or things like that. You can't hard code JDBC URLs. All that stuff is gone. You've got to be agile. You've got to say when a machine goes down, don't just sit there spinning, waiting for it to come back. What you have to do is actually say, let's go and reread our configuration, and see if it's come up with a different host name. You have to think that DNS may be more agile, so you bring up your JVMs with short lived DNS entries. You have to Stop assuming that your hard disks are actually physically there and something written to hard disk is actually persisted. You've really got to say, is, you know, is that a hard disk you trust or a transient one? And it's, it's going to make some big changes in the applications. Um, we've only just, we as in the software engineering community, we've only just begun to encounter these problems. And it, it's going to be really interesting. Now, here is a classic big server-side team project. You have the architects, the people that sit there in the room, they understand the specifications, they talk to management, and they design stuff. You've got the developers, their job, maybe the same people as architects, but they're, they're, the developer's problem is actually getting the application to work. Then, once they think it's working, there is the ops team, whose job is keeping the thing live in production. They keep it running. And then over in the corner, there are the business development people. Their job is to actually make sure that your organization brings in enough money 
to meet goals. So they, they, they won't worry about costs, they worry about revenue, they worry about where customer comes from, all that kind of stuff. Now here is what a classic server-side application used to look like. Even if you're a really agile project and your architects and developers had a nice design test code cycle up and running, at some point you said, yeah, this is really good. Operations, you go deploy it. It's going to be wonderful. And the ops team get given something that developers had working on their laptops, which doesn't really work well in production. So they have a staging process to check it works and things. And then off to the side, there's the business development team. They can make wildly optimistic guests saying, yes, we'll be so successful, we need these many thousand machines. If they get it wrong, you go bankrupt. Or they could say, nobody's going to use this, we need one machine. And if they get it wrong, nobody uses you, and you go away as well. So it, it, they've kind of been off in the corner, but actually their decisions have been really important in the past too. So, yeah, old world architects design stuff, developers build it, operations keep it running. If something doesn't work, the developers get the blame for their coding problems. If something doesn't work in production, like it's a security hole, the ops team get the blame for it, for not managing the machines properly. And if you've got the number of machines wrong, it's the business development people that are in trouble. The architects, they just design things. They don't get any blame at all. They're lucky. But once you're in a world where you can create your machines on demand, the whole kind of waterfall changes a bit. Now the architects have to say, we don't know how many machines will be running, and we're going to make that decision dynamically based on load. So we've got, they've got to design apps that say, we will be changing the number of machines we have based on demand. Your development team, they're going to have their own private clusters, rather than saying, oh, it works on my laptop, it's ready to ship. They can say, they, they can come in in the morning, bring up an entire cluster of machines with the complexity of the production cluster. And that's the point, it's as complicated as it will be in production. And then they can say, right, let's see if things work now on my machines. And then finally, the ops team, they can take the same VMs that have been built up and they can use it in production. While this is going on, the business development people, instead of having to make blind guesses months in advance, they can keep an eye on what's going on. They can have a look at the spreadsheets to say, oh, this is how many machines developers are running. They've been leaving them running too long. This is what we're using in production. This is how much money we're making in production service, therefore it's good. Or they can say, oh, no, we're not making enough money. You need to have lower spec machines or something like that. And one of the interesting trends in the world is towards services where you've got a free mode and a premium mode. And in those services, one of the big problems for the business development people is what makes people pay. And the way they do that, the trend is now to go through the logs of all your customers to try and differentiate what decisions it makes. There are suddenly somebody transits from being a non-paying customer to a paying one, a profit source. So your business development people, they really want to get the data, the log data, somehow from all your services, translated, analyzed, summarized, and then giving them information they can use for marketing. So everything changes now. There's a bit of a blurred world where everybody needs to have a look at what's going on on the machines and the infrastructure. Your application needs to talk to the infrastructure to create and delete machines on demand. Your developers need them. The ops team doesn't just need to do any production machines, but they need to be creating machines for the developers to be playing with as well. And your business, your business development people, they need to keep an eye on things too. So everyone needs access to the infrastructure. But I don't think it should be the same API. Right now, if you look at EC2, there's a command line API, there's some nice stuff in Firefox, there's some IDE plugins. But they're not really, they're very much a developer view. They're basically saying, I, I, I pick a virtual machine image, I create it, that's it. You shouldn't be, and that's, that's too low level. It's not what BizDev want, it's, it gives developers too much control. Really, they should be creating the machines the ops team design. So. What I've been exploring is the notion of adding, adding more role-centric user interfaces to, to cloud infrastructure and using Hadoop as the big use case for the problem, but also part of the behind-the-scenes work too. So, key point to take home. 
Hadoop is not only a tool for the applications, the code you're running, it is also the infrastructure for analysis and data mining which the infrastructure should be using. So we can go through the logs to say, this customer likes these machines with this network characteristics. We can say, these people, their applications have this behavior and should be placed over here in the data center. The big problem now is where do virtual machines go in the data center? How do you manage network traffic? And it, it's all data mining. And more subtly, it's all statistics too. You, there's never a big service isn't either perfectly up or perfectly down. It's more kind of up and down-ish for a while. So you need to analyze this stuff and really produce a vague summary of what's going on, enough to say, yeah, we're mostly happy. So that, that's a really big change. And the ops team, in, in particular, apart from the networking team, have yet to come to terms with it. So does Hadoop work in this world? And the answer is no. It actually, it's clearly been written, assuming that your data center is stable. You've got hard-coded URLs for the name node in there. The JVMs come up, they cache that IP address, so you can't even change your host name. You can't change DNS entries, and Hadoop can't handle it. It's, it's blacklisting policy says when a, when a machine is giving the wrong answers too, uh, too, too often, it says we will stop sending it any more work, which is the great policy for a big static data center, physical one. But in a virtual world, it's the wrong policy. In a virtual world, you want to say, OK, that machine's not behaving. Let's delete that machine. Let's send a complaint over to our infrastructure provider saying your, your physical machines are playing up. Let's go create a new one. And you can do other tricks that you can't do in the physical world. You can reassign hard disks. And when something goes down right now, Hadoop, the data nodes and the task trackers, the workers, the way they deal with failure of their servers is they just send a request out to the, they just keep on waiting for the ports to open on the master machines anymore. They never reread their configuration. The whole idea of that master server moving around just doesn't exist. So Hadoop is not agile. All these things are going to have to change. I've been trying to work on some of them, and I have patches that are not quite in there yet. But my goal is long term is to make Hadoop agile and provide the infrastructure for Hadoop to work in. What I've been doing, I'm going to give a quick overview today, is actually our prototype UI to make the creation of machines and Hadoop clusters easier. It's called Cloud Farmer, so farming your little cloud. And it tries to divide the work up between, currently between the ops and the developers, each have different ro roles. The business development side of things I haven't looked at yet at all. The first thing is what tools do the ops teams use? And they use VI because it is the editing tool of choice if you're operations team. It works over everything when everything else is down. But now, instead of editing host tables, what they're actually doing is designing a machine specification. So what they're doing here is using a template language, and they're saying, how do we define a machine? It says, this is my worker. It's got some text next to it. It tells me which boot volume to, to use. So the ops team, they can say, you're going to run off a different disk. If I'm a developer, I just ask for a worker. I don't care what disk it is or what particular host host options there are. All I care is I just ask for a worker or a master. And I, I don't even have to care what infrastructure I have. You can have different back ends for this, some of which are VMware, some of which are Zen, some of which are EC2. It doesn't really matter. I just ask for machines by name. What the ops people do is they specify the maximum minimum number of machines in a cluster. They can specify a list of links, template links, and which are basically protocols, ports, and paths. And those, that information can be fed back into the UI so I can actually browse these machines and I can get links that I can now click on live. So if someone, ideally not me, defines these. Then it gets fit into a web app that runs somewhere. It provides the front end that people can use. And as well, there's a command line front end as well, actually. For your, your, you can actually create machines as part of your build. But basically, I can list machines, say, OK, what kind of roles are they? So the notion is, we have a very basic notion of you don't ask for machine by, ho by kind of machine type or disk volume. That's all gone. You have machine roles, like worker, like master. And in a role, you have 
what services you want to run, your firewall options, what late binding installation actions you want done, rather than have a separate VM image for every single role in your, in your cluster, in your data center. You, ha you can have a one or two template images, and then after you've brought up the VM, do some late installations. That is very good as it keeps your cost of maintaining your VMs down. You can have one VM, you can keep up to date with security patches, but it can do lots of different roles. So here we have three roles, a generic machine, a worker, and a master. In the cluster, I'm limited to one master, that's the Hadoop master, which has the name, node, and job tracker. As many workers as I, uh, as I want, but the thing hints, it says I should have at least three. Without that, I don't get good redundancy. And I have some buttons on the side saying go create them. I also have some special Hadoop operations, and this is something that I've actually hard-coded in the web app to handle the, the fact that Hadoop isn't that agile. So what I do is I've basically got a dialog box saying, how many, how many workers do I want? I can get, give a range. Here I'm asking for one. Hit the Add button. The web application, it will, first thing it says, if, if we don't have a master in the cluster, it will create one. It will bring up the Hadoop master, and it will keep trying it until we get a Hadoop master. If that one doesn't come up, we'll kill it and restart. So we know that we, what host name we have, we're happy with before we go and do anything else. So we ask for some machines, we get a master and one or more workers. I have omitted about 30 seconds worth of pause here. And infrastructure takes time. But it's given me some machines. One of the weird things is that even in this cluster, the master node is actually a little data node too. And that's because of a weird problem. When they added restarting to the job tracker, it, the job tracker only comes up when the HFS file system is live, which means that it only comes up you have to have a data node in there as well, otherwise you, you, you have to have a full functional HDFS cluster. I've been working with Johannes to use different file systems, and that's where we'll be we're going in the future, but right now, this stuff is only on HDFS. Once I've got it up and running, I can say, give me, not just list all machines in my cluster, but I can say, give me all machines by role. And you can do actions like saying, I want to add a new machine in this role, I can delete the machines. It's a nice, it's a dim, simpler view of what's going on in my little virtual world. Or I can get a complete list of what's going on in my cluster. They have machine names and host names that are kind of meaningless, but that's infrastructures for you. The key point is my tool thinks they're all up, and it does that by actually checking them and pinging them and seeing that various ports are open as well. We can also click in and view what's going on, and that's where that template stuff, that link template stuff kicks in. So for a Hadoop master node, I have a complete list of all the really important links on there, on the job tracker itself and the name node and all those various things. So I can immediately start browsing the file system on my virtual cluster. And even though I've got a bit of Hadoop specificness in the web app right now, this whole template stuff is independent of Hadoop. You could deploy any kind of machine and it'll create the same whatever list of links you give it as a template. Once I'm there, I can actually click in and go straight into the real list of machines. I'm in the job tracker itself. Hands up, who finds this screen familiar? All right, there's the, the four, Hadoop, four or five Hadoop people in the corner, and Johannes, who did the work for the, the slides as well. You're familiar with it. Once you start using Hadoop, you will be very familiar with this indeed. Okay, there is, there is not much effort has been put into the Hadoop core to making anything look pretty. It's like quite a funny contrast to Yahoo's front end. So this is, this is all you get right now. Tells me how much space is available and how, well, how alive things are. We also have this little fancy graph view, which looks really pretty, but isn't actually, turns out to be not that useful. It, it's nice and it keeps, for demos it's great. People go, ooh, machines coming and ooh, machines going. But it doesn't scale to 40 or 50 machines. You know, the graphical view just doesn't scale in this world, actually. And that, that's an interesting problem, is once you go into really big clusters, how to represent the machines in their state. So I'm going to give a little demo video at the end, but it looks really nice when they come and go, but it's actually useless in production. So why have I been doing all this? The answer is I like to create Hadoop clusters on demand. With this UI, we can give the ops team the control of specifying the VMs, configuring the, saying what the cluster requirements are, 
then we have a tool that can actually bring up the clusters on demand, push work out to them. By having it in the back end, having a specific notion of, of roles and people asking for stuff, we could actually, you, we and the infrastructure providers can actually make decisions about where things should go better. Right now, you can, we, can, we log the data, we say what machines people grab, what they do, how, how much load they put on, what their network traffic is. So the next time I ask for a set of machines, you can go, okay, here are the characteristics. The thing I would like to do would actually go one step further and actually in that dialogue provide a list of data files you plan to work with. Because right now, nobody does VM placement takes into account where your data is going to be for the VMs themselves. But if you know, I'm going to do a Hadoop cluster, I'm going to go through last week's user logs, then say, right, here's a directory I'm going to use for. Give me a VM near that data. That will be good for the people bringing up the machines. It should be good for the infrastructure provider too, because it just means there's less cross data center bandwidth. The hard part about that is it's really hard to test that it works. You know, I can ask the infrastructure, say, give me something near that data. There's no way of me knowing whether it's been provided or not. It's just a hint. And from a testing perspective, hints that you can't verify are painful. So I'll put it in there, but I'm not quite sure that the infrastructure people really mean it. The other thing I'd like to do is go to more templates and rather than just a machine role, but go up to different things like I want a network role. So I just say, okay, a front end, a back end, and actually do a complete three tier multiple network configuration just by clicking on the different options. That is future work, meaning it's not there yet. Some of this stuff is all in public SVN repository. Other bits infrastructure behind. It's been done inside HP, but I'll be doing some stuff to work with EC2 as well. And there, I don't think I'll get the networking stuff because I don't get any options. And in fact, this is my current to-do list. Well, mine and Johannes over there, he's got the hard bits. A um, lot more work on VM placement. Where you put your VMs in, in the cloud, it's, it's the new kind of scheduling problem. Before it was which app gets to run, now it's where does your VM run. And if, if you're unlucky, you bring up a VM and you find it crawls. And the reason for that is because somebody on the same rack is killing the network. Or they're using the same CPU as you, or they're bringing the disk to its knees, and you end up suffering. The other thing is talking to business development and saying, you know, what do they want from this world? How do they want to view the infrastructures going on? How do they want to integrate the application use data that will be produced by the applications? Then we need to go to the applications, and particularly our friend Hadoop, and actually add better monitoring and management in there so we really can know what's going on. Right now, if Hadoop is taking its time, you can say this job's taking its time, but you can't say why. You can't say, is this VM slow? Is this particular job slow? What's happening? Oh, is there a network bottleneck? It's just, you know, you can say this total job took half an hour to run, but there's no, there's no data on why. I also need to get on with making my stuff agile, making Hadoop agile, and that means getting my patches in. The changes that I've made to Hadoop to make it deal with machines moving around, they're all in there in Apache Jira as uncommitted patches meaning Yahoo and Facebook and people that don't have dynamic data centers aren't happy with them. As far as they're concerned, anything that doesn't have tangible benefits, their physical static data structures, but helps in the agile world, isn't really their concern. So we've got to deal with that. I might, I might have to try checking it in while nobody's looking and see what happens. And um, you know, the next big thing is actually just using Hadoop to analyze all the data. That's uh, so the VM histories, but also actually we've been starting to do better monitoring inside the physical machines as well. Um, there's a product placement here. Some of the forthcoming new HP Blade servers have these really fancy BIOSes that when a, when a machine crashes, they basically bypass the OS and snapshot the entire machine image at that point. And what you can do with it, the image of a crashed machine, you can just stick it into an HFS file system or other file system and try and analyze what went wrong. You're going to understand the stack traces. Because things do go wrong, so let's start learning out why. And we have a great tool on the job, and it's called Hadoop. Now, while I answer questions, I'm going to give a video of this working.
This is a quick video of the UI working. I have edited out the, all the random delays which will happen, so people can watch that while I, I'll take and answer questions, and I can maybe give more demos to people later on in the day. Um, how do you reconcile the configuration of the VM with the configuration of Hadoop uh, to the application's needs? Oh, that's a good question. How do we do that? So the real problem is, is that your Hadoop clients, they need a Hadoop XML file that says this is the host name. Yeah, here is the machine you're working on. What we do is we do a bit of a cheat here. In fact, I'll pause the video and switch over to the code. Nobody has seen any code today, have they? Um, what I do is I have a static JSP page that I'm trying to remember where it is now. I can't find where the, actually, let's find it here. This project is called Mombasa, by the way. It's, if you're going to see elephants from the UK, it's where you'd fly to. Um, what we do is somewhere we provide a page that gives you the configuration file. Is it this one? No. Um, all right, I'll skip it and go back to the video. Explain what I do. What happens is the web app has a URL, a static URL to say, give me the config file that you can get, do a get from to give me the XML file. But what it really does is it asks the live job tracker for its own XML file. It does a redirect behind the scenes, grabs it, and feeds you back. So your client code, you just know that you hit this URL before you do a run to grab the Hadoop site configuration XML file, and every time the job tracker comes up, the actual contents of that file will be different. What we have to do is a bit trickier, is after bringing up the cluster, you have to tell the name node and the job tracker who it is itself. So the XML file for the cluster itself goes, this is your host name. And this is really important once you start bringing up machines with multiple network cards. This isn't a recommendation, but everybody who's playing with Hadoop right now, do not start by bringing up having machines with multiple network interfaces, because you will bring up bits of your Hadoop cluster on different network interfaces from the other, and then you won't understand why things don't talk to each other. And it, you can see it on the mailing list all the time, people saying, oh, my data nodes don't see my master node, and the answer is, oh, you've got your network settings wrong. So start off with one network interface and turn your firewalls off. This is our fancy view here. Um, so what we do is we get the official public, the, the in data center host name for the machines, and then we feed that fully qualified domain name through to the job tracker and the name node, bring it up, and all the workers, we bring up the name node first and the job tracker, once they're up, then we go and create the other workers. If a name node doesn't come up, then we, we kill that and kind of back off and try recreating a new name node because the workers, they're not agile yet. They don't handle name nodes moving around. So you make sure your name node and job tracker are up first. Does that answer your question? Oh, another one. Um, and uh, what about memory configuration? So um, with how much memory do, bring, do you bring the VM up? Um, that, that really depends on what your application is, actually. On, on our cluster, the stuff we have inside HP, we don't really get much freedom on that. I don't know what the numbers are. They're just machines. In EC2, you can have small, medium, and large. And the big issue there is you don't just get restricted memory, but actually you get restricted network bandwidth off, off machine, particularly, but I think even in cluster. And if you're running Hadoop, you're going to find that network bandwidth is trouble. When you're doing development and testing, like me, uh, we're bringing up machines up and down on a regular basis. In that world, you ask for the smallest machines you have because you get the smallest bill at the end of the week. And you know, you've got machines that last 10 minutes or less. It's not worth paying the premium. For production, I think try with the smallest machines you can get away with. If that doesn't work, ask for bigger machines. Another question there? I think I'll wait for the microphone. Have you, yeah, um, 
Uh, would you consider this to be a, an attempt at an open source sort of R path? Uh, R path? I don't know if you're familiar with R path. Sort of yeah. Um, I've looked at it and not played with it much. They've. I'm trying to think. Well, some people have done some other template stuff too. So the R path they provide machine images for EC2, don't they? They're kind of ready to go. What I'm trying to do is a bit more in the kind of the late binding stuff. So my, my VMs come up, they install the RPMs as, as you go along. And that actually makes things very flexible. You only need really one machine image. And you make a very late binding decision about what they're going to do. And it's, it's the web app that makes those decisions. I've got a, a heckle here from the front here. Stephen? Have you actually looked into puppets as a system administration tool, late binding configuration stuff and all that? Yeah, I know puppets. We've been using SmartFog, which is the AP o HP open source one instead. They're very similar. It's Java based, which makes it easy to work with Java code. It makes it harder to work with raw Linux machines because you've got to have Java installed and up and running first. So my boot process, which is very similar to the startup problem, actually the machine comes up the first thing it does is run a script which copies in the RPMs of my choice into the machine, installs them. My client, the web app, is actually first trying to resolve the DNS host name, waiting for the machine to resolve. Then it starts hitting the port to say, is the port there? At which point it has to SSH in and keep issuing the command which SF start until it knows that the smartphone commands are actually on the command line. And you know, because install, you might be able to SSH in before the thing installs. If after a couple of minutes it's not there, you've got problems. Back off and start reporting errors. But otherwise, we we put it in there. Once we've got the tools up and running, we we push out the deployments and let it handle it itself. A big goal is to actually, even though we can do stuff with smartphone, you can manage your whole cluster of machines. In this world, I want every single machine to be standalone, so that if something else goes down, the other machines don't care. So each machine has an independent configuration. We push it out. We also push out the, the client VM code, sorry, the web app. It can live either in the infrastructure itself, which is the ideal place, or it can live outside, which is best for development. It can work on my laptop or my desktop. And so it does all its operations by SSH. So it, it pushes out all its commands by SSH to the command line and gets error strings back which is quite hard to report to a web application, actually. You're trying to get error strings back from a, a remote machine and collect all the stuff. That brings another problem, actually, which is when things go wrong, you want to collect the error logs from the VMs before you delete them. Okay, that's a very handy trick for anybody in this world, is collect the error logs from all your machines, then tear them down. Because otherwise, you'll know something went wrong, but you'll never know why, because the machine is no longer there. Okay, that's good. All right, I'll finally close by pointing out a lot of this stuff is actually open source in SVN repository. Currently LGPL licensed, but we can hit the switch and go to BSD Apache whenever we feel like it. It's just a matter of there's some OSGI integration to deal with first. And well, it's free to play with. So grab it, play with it, and then send me emails. Oh, one more question. You were mentioning need of testing support at the beginning of the talk. What type of activity for the project? Okay, testing. Right, so the API here, this is the, the web UI. But in fact, I have another API I can actually do as part of a test run. Or can I can actually say, bring up a set of machines and then do the install and test. So that, that's how I test my, how do you test an infrastructure is you ask for machines. And you tell them down. The web app itself is more complicated. You, I use HTML unit and push it through its life cycle. But again, it's dynamically deployed on whatever machine I choose. So all my tests, I have no unit tests. All my tests are functional tests where I deploy either the web app on its own against a mock back end or production where you've actually got a real cluster behind the scenes. I think all cloud infrastructure should actually provide a test a test backend. So I have, in my, my main backends, I have a manual set of machines that basically says, here is a list of machines, and you, you just provide the machine names, and it will pick one at random. But I have a mock one that 
purely it fakes. It fakes the machines, and you basically say, here are my internal external domain names. Give me my delay in milliseconds for a machine to come up. And you can change that, say, what happens if it takes an hour for the machine to come up? And you can actually turn a switch on to say, no, you're not really there, so I can simulate failures. It's actually the failure modes is actually really hard to test in this world. And it's where, even though someone could say, right, I'm going to read, the, say, the EC2 spec and then emulate it, your code's going to fail in different ways from Amazon's. And it's handling those failures and simulating them will be really important. So if anyone's planning on building cloud infrastructure out there, apart from me and Johannes, provide a separate public test API which you can configure to fail in interesting ways, the same error messages and the same strings as you'll get in production, and your end users will be grateful. Otherwise, things go wrong, you get a stack trace, some people somewhere sees it, and then they send hate emails to whoever's running the system saying it didn't work, what happened, and you don't have a clue. Another question? Yeah. Um, from speaking to various people, I've heard that the latency and I.O. problems on, on uh, Amazon make it pretty much unusable for a lot of Hadoop projects. Could you say that's... Uh, Could you hold the microphone a bit closer? Actually, give me a sorry, I'll start again. Um, from speaking to various people, they've, they've reported that Hadoop doesn't run very well on Amazon. Is that something that you would like to comment on? Okay. Firstly, um, I work for HP, not Amazon, so I, I can't be negative about it. You know, one of the, the big question is what are the problems? On all virtual machines, I.O. sucks, okay? And the problem is it's all virtualized. Your code thinks, oh, I'm accessing a local hard disk, but really you're accessing a virtual hard disk, which is then representing a different file system, and it's seeking and all the rest of it. So your I.O. bandwidth is a lot slower. So from a pure I.O. perspective, performance is atrocious, and we can see that on our stuff too. However, if you are talking to some physical storage, which rather than an HDFS file system, then you can get better performance, although you're going over the network instead, so you've got network costs there. The other thing is, if you're doing graph-centric code, we're doing some stuff where we have, also in our public SVN repository, product placement here, we have an implementation of PageRank for Hadoop, which is written by a colleague of mine, Paolo. And there, it doesn't actually take any less time on a virtual cluster than it does in a physical one, because most of it is in memory, in CPU work. And that, that, that's as fast in a virtual world as in a physical world. The modern Intel and AMD CPUs are very good at virtualized CPU processing. It's only I.O. that's really bad. The other thing that can kill the problem on Hadoop is when your machines get put out over the cluster or big data center in a scattered way. So that there's no, there's no locality where the machines are. You can kind of guess the topology maybe, but it will change, and you're very vulnerable to other people using the network. You've got no control there at all. Okay. So if there are no more questions, let's thank Steve for a great talk.